I'm sure even Paul would be confused by all of this. But let's turn in our Bibles then to this wonderful psalm. I'm sure in most of our copies of the Bible, we have the same heading as there are, is in mine, a psalm of David. And it's headed a contemplation. I think in a sense that needs a bit of explanation and I'll just give it no. David isn't just dealing with one particular thing. He starts off setting forth for us the enormity of what it means to be saved, forgiven by God, as we say in New Testament language, born again of the Holy Spirit. And uh, all the wonders and the blessings that God gives to those who do come and trust in him. But then immediately afterwards we have those, perhaps what seem to be at first strange words, of regret and sorrow and suffering and all that kind of thing because he's talking about a time when it seems he had sinned but didn't either realize it or hadn't confessed it until he says he came and he did do so and God forgave him all his evils and then in that seventh verse we'll come to it he tells God you are my hiding place the transformation is complete and he's discovered the wonder and the glory of knowing what it means to be truly forgiven and saved by the grace of God. And then he seems to me to stop talking and writing and listening. God speaks to him. I will guide you with my eye. And then in those last two verses, the cry of God himself, for those of us who know and love him, how he wants us to respond and behave as we come into his own presence. We called this this morning, or I called it this morning, the blessed man. This word blessed we do need to just perhaps reflect on for a moment or two. It has been described by many writers and authors and commentators as meaning happy. But we do need to remind ourselves that often in the Bible, words that we use in our everyday language mean something different in Scripture. When, for example, we talk about peace in the Bible, it does mean something very, very different to what we think of in this world in which we're living. I suspect many, don't, many of us have much peace about the present time with the election coming up. But we are before God in a different world which we have to deal with. I remember as a child in those early days when the Second World War was going furiously and we kept living in the airy shelter that was provided for us, with bombs falling around and guns firing and sirens sounding and all this kind of thing, hearing the adults talking about, won't it be wonderful when peace comes? For them, peace means when war is over. For us, it means peace while the war is going on. While we're still in this world and we're still suffering and struggling, and as Paul puts it in his New Testament epistle, we are engaged in a warfare. We cannot escape that, but it doesn't mean that we're waiting for peace in heaven. We have it here and now. Yes, and the wonder and the glory of the Christian message is that God doesn't just give us lovely feelings and a feeling of satisfaction and all that kind of thing. God gives us himself. And Paul tells us in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus has done that. And he says, talking about the difference between Jews and Gentiles, he himself is our peace. When we look at this word blessed, and if we say it means happiness, we have to remind ourselves it's a very different meaning to what we think of here in this world, which depends upon our circumstances. We can be happy if we've got food in our inside. We can be happy if we've got a roof over our heads. We can be happy if we've got good health, if the money's coming in from our work, if the children are growing up nicely. All these things are dependent upon circumstances. But what David is talking about is not dependent on circumstances, but dependent upon God. And here, as we turn to it this morning, he says, Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, and again repeats it, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute, that means reckon up iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. 
We may wonder, perhaps we should, how it's possible for David, living hundreds of years before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into this world, could talk and testify in this kind of way. And it simply emphasizes the wonder and the glory both of God and of his wonderful gospel. It's true the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't going to come and appear in this world in Bethlehem and be laid in the manger and all that took place afterwards for hundreds of years. And yet David speaking with such certainty as though it's already taken place. And the glorious message of the Bible to us this morning is it had already taken place. Because the Bible tells us in the New Testament that the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, he was going to be slain on the cross at Calvary. But God had already established that before time began. He is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. How can that be? Well, when you and I make our plans for the future, the Bible tells us that we should be very careful to acknowledge that we're not in charge and in command of these things. God is not our servant to do what we want. He is in command and in control. And so we should say, whether we use the words or not, God permitting, God willing. But when God makes his plans and establishes his purposes and his agreements in heaven, he doesn't have to turn to anyone else. It is God Almighty who is upon that throne and in control. And when the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit agreed in eternity how mankind, when Adam was made and God knew that he would sin, how he would deal with it all and make it all come right again. And the Lord Jesus Christ agreed with his Father and the Holy Spirit he would come. And it amazes me what he must have been thinking in heaven for all those years of the Old Testament, particularly in Israel, when they were so far removed from him. The day is coming when I'm going to go, and I have to lay down my life. He was going to become a man and live here among us, and in Bible language, bear our sins in his own body on the tree. And yet, even more than that, the Bible also says he didn't just bear them as it were on the outside. He became sin for us, who himself knew no sin, so that you and I could become the righteousness of God in him. What happens then after this declaration of amazement and wonder and joy in these opening verses that he turns to these next ones and speaks of this terrible period or time, however long or short it was in his life, when he says, my bones grew old when I kept silent through my groaning all the day long, and so on. Had God not said when David was just a young lad something very special about him? King Saul had gone astray and God had dismissed him and sent the prophet Samuel to appoint and anoint a new man to be king over Israel. And he came to that house and went through all those young men thinking this might be the one, and God said no each time. And in the end, the prophet, perhaps amazed and bewildered, said to the father, is there nobody else? And it seems as though Jesse must have said, well, yeah, but I didn't think it was worth bringing him in. He's just a young lad out looking after the sheep. And Samuel said, bring him in. And when he arrived, God spoke into the heart of the prophet and said, this is the man. And you remember his testimony, a man after God's own heart. Had God got that wrong? Had he misread David and what he was going to fall into and get involved in in his older years? Was this God not really understanding what was going to take place and having to rethink his own testimony about this young fellow at the time? No. The Bible tells us God knows the end from the beginning. The Bible tells us he knows all things. 
and he has chosen us in the Lord Jesus Christ that we may be forgiven and saved, not when we were born or living in this world, but before time began, when the Lamb of God was slain from before the foundation of the world. And just as we in this world have our records of births, marriages, and deaths in our various countries, so ours is written in heaven. In the Lamb's Book of Life, our names recorded that God would call us to be his children in the process of time. But it doesn't mean that David was going to live a pure, holy, spotless life 24 hours a day. He was still in this world just as you and I are still in this world. God didn't have to wait and see what David would do. He knew what he was going to do. But in his goodness, in his grace, and in his mercy, he had forgiven him. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ in the plan and purpose of God, slain in heaven and poured out at Calvary. God Almighty performing his own work. And of course it reminds us as well that in this world we're going to have many, many experiences, both ups and downs, as the days come and go, not always sin, but bewilderment and confusion and difficulties and problems and great challenges. It reminds me of that dear man Job in the Old Testament, man whom God himself again said to Satan is like no other. When he came to be put to the test, his experiences were like it in the fairgrounds, those helters and skelters. His wife said to him when their family were all gone, when his wealth was gone, when his health was broken, curse God and die. And he said, you're talking like the foolish people. Shall we not receive bad things from God as well as the good? And as the days went on and his friends, not understanding anything that was going on, accused him of so much that he hadn't done. He came to a place where it seems to me he could have been writing something for the Apostle Paul to proclaim in the New Testament when it came. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And he believed in the resurrection, though after my flesh worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God whom I shall see for myself and not another. And reading that, I've often thought to myself, Job, you've reached the mountaintop. But within a couple of chapters, we find him down in the valley again. Oh, that I knew where I might find him. Where's God gone? I want to come and tell him what I feel in my heart and soul. I want to know what it is that he's doing with me. These ups and these downs are normal in every Christian life. And as we go onwards, no matter how young or old we may be, we can expect nothing else in this world but trials and troubles. In the world, says the Lord, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world. July the 4th has no bearings against the plans of God. So he tells us what it is that he did as he comes to this moment of his remembrance of his confession. I acknowledged my sin. I said, I will confess them to my God and you forgave all my iniquity. I confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Reading this, I'm sure all of us who are Christians have at various times, not just at the beginning, at those occasions when we've felt so down and downcast and sinful and evil and out of touch with God because of some thought or idea or action or whatever it may have been as we've gone on in our life. But coming to this with David, is one of the greatest blessings we can ever face. What is that? 
It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit of where we've gone wrong. And the call of God to come back to him again. Isn't that amazing grace? Isn't that glorious love? Isn't that not like us where we'd say, I can never talk to that person again. God in heaven saying, your sins are forgiven. You've been under guilt and shame, but now you realize all over again, years after the moment of your new birth, what it means to be washed and cleansed and purified. And in all of this, we're told in the Bible that in heaven, our blessed Lord and Saviour, seated on that throne at the right hand of the majesty and glory, ever lives to make intercession for us. This clearly, clearly, clearly cannot and does not mean that in heaven, when the Father looks at me, he turns to the Son and said, what's he doing here? And Jesus having to say, no, it's all right, Father. His name's in the book of life, and he came to salvation when he was 11. I know he's gone astray, but I've forgiven him. Oh, that's all right. No, 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 no. There's no conversation of any kind like that in the heavenly glory. When Jesus was here, he said, I and my Father are one. I always do the things that please my Father. The things I say are what my Father wants me to say. I don't go against him in any kind of way at all. And if you go back, as we have done after Peter's ministry recently, to the story of Christmas time, or at least that week or so just afterwards in Jerusalem, when Simeon took that babe out of the arms, presumably it was Mary holding him, and looked at him, Jesus didn't say a word. He was a baby. He who brought everything into being in heaven and in earth by the words of his mouth had to learn to speak. Whether he was awake or asleep, we do not know. But he spoke to Simeon. He spoke because of who he is. He spoke because of who he was. And Simeon said to the Lord, you've told me I'll have to wait to die until I've seen your salvation. I'm ready. I've seen your salvation. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. In heaven, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is interceding for us at this very moment. Not with words, but because he is there, his very presence in the heavenly glory who took our sin and shame and guilt and everything accused against us there on the cross at Calvary. Now he says to the Lord, the transformation is complete. For this cause, what is that? What we've just been saying. God has taken hold of us. God has taken hold of David. The transformation was complete. Yes, it was going to be marred again and again. The soul was righteous in the sight of God. Every sin, past, present, and future, the blessed man knows has been forgiven. And here we find, as we turn to God again with David, for this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near them. And then he says this, you, what we said earlier, you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. David knew what it was to be opposed, both by King Saul when he was being chased across the countryside, hiding in the mountains, in the forests, in the hills, in the caves, seeking shelter away from his enemy. And later on, of course, when things like that went wrong again and again, you shall preserve me from trouble, you shall surround me with songs of deliverance. But he's now saying it wasn't the woods and the forests and the caves and the hills that secured me. 
it was you. I remember as a, a youngster sitting in that air raid shelter in the old Kent Road where we were brought up, in an air raid and a bomb falling across the road. And I can see now the ladies sitting round in the shelter. It was a, a basement flat that had been reinforced. They all shot from one side to the other doing this. And my father was home from the army on leave and I was sitting on his lap and my little brother on the other knee. And Dad saying to the ladies, all right, all right, don't frighten the children. I remember perhaps smugly saying to myself, I'm not frightened. Dad is here. And that word Abba, which we find several times on the lips of Jesus and in the New Testament, means precisely that. Years ago, when our daughter was studying, she was going to be a children's nanny and that kind of thing. She was placed in a family and she wrote to tell us all about it. The family was a Jewish family. And she said, it's interesting. The children call their mother, mummy, like we do. They don't call their father, daddy. They call him Abba. I remember reading about a man who was watching his father being taken away, a Jewish family. Father, he recognized, was not going to see his son again. And the boy called out after his dad, Abba, Abba, Abba. Our Father, we prayed this morning, which art in heaven. And it is not then as it was the air raid shelter which protects us now. It is the living God. David says in other places, yes, I've sheltered in the cave. But that's not what shelters me. You yourself are my rock and my fortress. He fought Goliath. But it wasn't the stones that protected me. You yourself are my shield and my exceeding great reward. I'm perhaps thinking of better days and times to come. You yourself are my glory and the lifter of my head. Later in Psalm 86, the psalmist, in the course of what he's saying, prays this prayer Give me an undivided heart. Is that your prayer this morning? Is that why you gathered here with us so that we might together call upon the name of the Lord and say to him, Give me an undivided heart. It's wonderful to talk about, think about, hear about the blessed man who is saved and forgiven. But I want a heart that meets with you. I want to focus on these next two verses, eight and nine. But it seems to me it is God who is responding to the cry and the prayer and the testimony of his servant here upon earth. God says this, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. We have, I think, become accustomed to all of us through the years and it's biblical. We're not denying anything like that thinking of the Lord Jesus in a rather different kind of way. He says in the New Testament, doesn't he, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, and so on. And particularly in those days, unlike in this country, I don't know about others, the shepherd may call the sheep or chase them around, but in those days and in that part of the world, the shepherd would lead the flock where he wanted to take them and have them go. And so the image could easily be taken to be that all we ever see of our blessed Lord and Saviour and our Good Shepherd is his rearward parts. Rather, perhaps like he said to his servant in the Old Testament, when he desired to see something of God's glory, you will see my backward parts. But here God is saying something rather different. 
It hasn't changed. He's not suddenly improved things. This is how it's always been. You remember that story of Jacob, wasn't it? In the Old Testament, when he was coming back and fearful of meeting his brother, whom he'd deceived and so on in those earlier days. And God came to him. He thought it was another man, it seems to start with. And he wrestled with him through the night. And as morning came, he heard the other person say, let me go. And Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. That is the great blessing that God brought upon Jacob in the early hours of that morning. And hear what God is saying to you and me here at this present time. With all the changes and challenges that come in life is this. You're not just watching me from behind. Your experience of me and you is face to face. We don't come into the presence of God and pray to the back of his head. We come into the presence of God by faith, in spirit, and meet him face to face. His eye, he says, is upon us. The amazing and glorious thing about all of this is that God has a plan and a purpose, not just for the world, not just for the church in it, but for every single individual one of us. He leads, he guides, he provides, he undertakes. And God's own desire and call to David at this time is this. Don't be like the horse or mule who have a mind of their own and insist on going their own way. I sometimes looked on the computer at some of the horse guards' experiences up in Whitehall. I used to think it was the man on the back of the horse that was in charge, but it seems as though it's the horse in charge underneath the man these days. And the horse can jump and buck and sometimes throw him off and all kinds of things can happen. God says, don't be like that. Don't try to turn against me. You have, as my people, a liberty that you never experienced before you came to know and love me. But that liberty is not to go out and to do what you want to do and please yourself. That liberty is to go out and do what I want you to do and to please me. I want you to live with me and for me. I want you to be my people here in this present world in preparation for what you will be when you're here with me in heaven. And of course, the great ultimate that God has in mind and in view is when we see him, we shall be like him. In preparing all of this, I couldn't get away from certain thoughts and ideas and so on that kept coming. From days that I've learned a lot about what God has done in this country, particularly in one part of it, 120 years ago this year, in the land of Wales. The church was in a terrible state and condition. There were just a few who were concerned about what needed to be done. And they were praying for a mighty moving of God. We don't hear the language much. We've been talking and praying about it more in Lansdowne over recent times. The language of revival. We're living in times in our country when nothing seems to be going right, when government rules and regulations are against what the Bible teaches us, when people don't even keep the rules and regulations that are passed by Parliament, 
and the government is seeking constantly, whichever it is, to pass new laws to outlaw this and disgrace that, and make people change. It baffles me, people don't observe the laws we've already got. Why they should want to pass new ones is, is amazing. But when God started to move in Wales 120 years ago, all of these problems suddenly disappeared. How? In the church services, and it wasn't just one man doing it, it began to spread across what we call the Principality of Wales. Men and women in churches began to realize God was there. They began to call out to him for mercy and praise, change. And God responded. People who'd never been in a church began to come in to find out what was going on. And services were extended not for an hour and a half, but for half the night. The churches were opened for meetings and so on when they'd never been opened before. One of the amazing things is that the police in the streets began to find they had nothing to do. The men, and particularly the coal miners, as they came up out of the pits, weren't going to the pubs and the betting shops and the vice dens. They weren't fighting in the streets. They weren't causing mayhem and trial and trouble on every side. The police discovered they were now in the churches. They were in the services, the prayer meetings, and the Bible studies. Such Christian bookshops as there were began to complain, we can't get enough Bibles to sell. People were calling upon the name of the Lord and being saved. But above that, the Christians were being changed. God had come in a new kind of way. And it wasn't just in the adult numbers of the churches. It was amongst the young people and the boys and girls. They were not carrying knives in their pockets. They were carrying Bibles in their hands. The miners who were going down into the pits, a miserable life, went down early to have prayer meetings together before they started work. And when lunchtime came, they sat there to eat their sandwiches covered in coal dust. They opened their Bibles and talked about the things of God together. And would you believe this? The reports were that even the ponies that lived and worked in the coal mines, never came out, knew that revival had come. How? They'd been trained to be shouted at, cursed, sworn at, blasphemed at, beaten, to make them do the duties of pulling the trucks and things that they needed to do. Now the miners were saying, come along, Daisy, old love. We've got to get you moving. You pull, I'll give a push to help. And those poor ponies, if they could have used words, were looking at one another and saying, what on earth are they talking about? What's changed them? They had to learn, even the animals, a new language. God was in the coal mines, as well as in the churches and in the streets. The pubs and the betting shops which Closing, the churches were opening. Is there not hope for what we see around us here in West Norwood in this present day and this present time? I will guide you with my eye. These last two verses 
or a kind of bringing together from the Lord what he wants his people to do and how he wants them to behave and to respond to him. Let me just read them. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. In Psalm 47, the writers there say, Clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Now, let me tell you this in case you hadn't realized. I am a very typical Englishman. I can't imagine myself shouting in the church service, in the prayer meeting, in a Bible study, in a time of worship, I find it hard even to clap my hands. It isn't unusual for me to move my hands around. Let me just confess this. I've always spoken with my hands. We had in our early days at home with the children, we see around the table four of us, and the children, as I was talking and doing this all the time, we start moving the glasses and the cups and the things out of the way in case they got hit for six. And on occasions, they take my hands, one in each, put it on the table, and they say, Now, Dad, talk to us, and roar with laughter when I couldn't say a word. I don't use my hands like that these days. I have to use them for another purpose, and that's holding on for dear life in case I fall over, is not the physical, the natural that we're talking about here. This is a spiritual response to God. And me with my English sentiment cannot begin to imagine what I might be like when God comes in revival. Are we ready for that? There are those who worry and wonder if we clap our hands, are we becoming like other churches? All I can say is this. Here in our church, we remember the Lord and his death in what we call the communion of the Lord's Supper. In some churches, it's called Holy Communion. Does that mean we're joining the Anglican people or the Roman Catholics? Here in this church, we baptize under here, the baptismal pool is people who have come to know and to love the Lord Jesus. Does that mean we're becoming what's called a Baptist church? Here in this church, some folks clap their hands. Does that mean we're becoming Pentecostal? I do speak in another language that the Bible calls an unknown tongue. Does that make me a charismatic? Surely what God is saying here is, he's not calling us to be like other Christians. He's calling us to be like God. Calling us to be like the Lord Jesus. Calling us to respond to him with thanksgiving and with praise. You may yet find me clubbing my hands in the presence of God. Isn't it strange? We are peculiar people. If I'm sitting in a concert listening to something wonderful and I've enjoyed it, I can happily clap with everybody else. Doesn't God deserve something better than that? I'm not suggesting we spend our time doing that all the time. One of the problems they faced in Wales during those times when God was moving mightily was that they forgot they needed keep preaching the word of God. And newcomers coming in, people who weren't saved, weren't hearing the Bible open up to them. That had to be addressed. They had to come back to it. God wants us to grow in grace and in our knowledge and love of him. 
Our final hymn this morning, if we're still going to sing that in a short while, is one that comes from that Welsh revival. They used to call it the love song of the revival in Wales. There were only two verses in those days, and it was written in Welsh. It has been translated, thankfully, into English. And another two verses were added to it later on, and I believe other verses have been added in our present day and age as well. But I just want to... I was going to say, yeah. There's a hymn I want to pass on to you that means so very much to me. I'm in danger of great excommunication here because it was written by a Roman Catholic monk a thousand years ago. And it was written in Latin. But 200 years or so ago, somebody translated it into English. And this man clearly knew and loved the Lord. Jesus the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast but sweeter far thy face to see and in thy presence rest nor voice can sing nor heart can frame nor can the memory find a sweeter sound than thy blessed name, O Saviour of mankind. O hope of every contrite heart, O joy of all the meek, to those who fall, how kind thou art, how good to those who seek. But what to those who find? Ah, this nor tongue nor pen can show the love of Jesus. What it is, none but his loved ones know. Jesus, thy mercies are untold. Through each returning day, thy love exceeds a thousandfold whatever we can say. And then this, Jesus, our only joy be thou, as thou our prize will be. Jesus, be thou our glory now and through eternity. Are you wanting are you waiting? Are you willing? Amen.